David works in this area of the smart grid of how do you get more efficiency, you know, using information and data and the things that we collect, how do you get more out of our existing infrastructure and the resources that we consume? Uh, because we, we have greater demands and greater expectations. Well, he's gonna take that and he's actually been working on a way to um, turn that around a little bit and look at how we produce food and to stop thinking about, well, what, what do we have to add to, what do we have to spray on things to fix nitrogen? Or what do we have to spray on things to add these nutrients or everything? And to look at different ways to do that that it maybe have lower impact, and that can be scaled through traditional commercial and, and some of the you know some of the larger methods because we're going to have to do that. There is no, there is no oh we want to turn back the hand of time and, and we want six billion five hundred thousand five hundred million people to disappear quickly so that we can solve problems with this population size that we want to have. I mean that's just not going to happen. So he's going to take a little bit different approach, but I encourage you to look at this and say wow between the three talks I've heard today. What do I want to do? What, what is the opportunity for me to make a difference in this space where what we have is not working and something else is going to have to come along? So, David Wexler, um, when you're ready, let's get going. Okay, thank you. Okay, first I'd like to give thanks to Dan and Openly Disruptive for uh, having me over here today. Um, thank you, Jake, for helping me out earlier. <clears throat> okay. From lightning in the sky to our gadgets and our bodies too, the presence of electricity is everywhere. It is capable of enhancing many aspects of our lives. Um, but what could it do for plants? Well, today I'm going to show you how plant electrification could be used for accelerating the growth of plants and how it could be of great benefit to urban agriculture. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to growing food in cities, like this dense monstrosity over here, you don't see any places to really grow food. So what we need to do is first find places to grow, then we need to optimize growth so we can maximize our yield. We have to keep our costs low. Um, and from there, we, at the same time, we need to start thinking about uh, contamination issues with regards to food safety. This is a city, by the way. So when it the, the partial so solution that's available is, you know, we have indoor hydroponics and vertical wall systems, balconies too. But e again, once we're, we find the, the, the solution, we really need to optimize capacity. We want to get things going. And how are we going to do that? Well, about 200 years ago, some people discovered that you could mix plants and electricity and get the following results. Now, it's... Um, who here actually thinks, uh, is, is actually amazed that this was possible 200 years ago? Where did they get the electricity from? In fact, they're not the oldest ones. Way back then, in the time of Stonehenge, people used, brought their seeds to these places as part of seed fertility rituals. And as a result, they would get huge increases in crop growth, germination, um, less chance of drought, and disease uh, resistance. Um, all due to a high concentration of electric fields found there. I tend to think of electric culture as kind of like giving, a, giving your plant a shot of Red Bull, an energy drink. What it does is it gets the metabolism going, gets the hormones pumping, and it uh, effectively gives it a lot more energy. And you can see that in this uh, next picture, where the plants, this, this was my very first experiment about four years ago, and the plant on the right it has a much deeper green color, and it gets even more green as time goes on. Um, and what that really means is we're increasing the, uh, the sugar production. We're making photosynthesis much more uh, efficient. And by, by doing that, you're going to get sweeter fruits, sweeter vegetables, and more, um, more energetic uh, fuel crops. In this example, we're showing some pepper plants that we run electricity directly through the inside of the plant in a slightly different method, and we've got a higher root mass. Um, what this does, it increases the nutrient capacity within the plants, um, while also creating a strong foundation for, for heavier crop loads. Here's another experiment I did um, on some lettuce plants. We're using very low, very small amounts of power here, uh, about one volt. We get a higher germination rate and faster growth as well. What you could get out of this is that farmers who are, looking, who are buying large amounts of seeds, they can increase the vitality of their seeds and have less go to waste. In this experiment, you could see how 
um, some broccoli plants that were growing. The electrodes are over here. This one's about three times larger than the one that's just outside of the electric field. Um, and if we could get faster time to market through these methods, um, commercial growers could get um, higher market prices, or you could reduce the risk of um, falling uh, victim to an early frost. Now, here's some of the, uh, the research institutions that have been working on this for over the past 100 years or so, uh, including WashU, local university. And we've been, um, they've been doing a lot of research into the science, the electricity behind the scenes, both applying electricity to it and vice versa. Um, another way that we could um, use electricity is in reducing costs. When you apply the electricity to the soil, it has an energizing effect on soil bacteria, which could basically uh, lower your costs by more than 30% in a whole number of different ways. Um, in addition to that, it also activates this uh, antibiotics that, that form within different types of uh, soil bacteria. And so you could get a, uh, you, it could take away or reduce the susceptibility to different molds, rots, and fungi, while at the same time keeping away um, different forms of insects. And um, it's just super fantastic. The, the next thing I want to touch on is urban food safety. If, if you think about it, cities rebuild themselves over and over and over again. And so if you're going to be growing food in a city, you have to think about you know, what was here before. And what inspired me to think about this was I was, uh, I was digging in my yard at home. And as we're, dig as we're digging up with, uh, with my daughters, we came across all this old junk. I mean, we're in, we're in the suburbs and we still come across like old car parts and, and, and old electronics. And we're like, you know, how does this affect my, my food? My, you know, the safety of the food I'm consuming. And, you know, this is something that we need to think about. And how do you solve it? I mean, FEMA's not gonna help everyone. So the way we, we're handling this is we have a project going on in North St. Louis, the Sunflower Project. And what we're doing is growing a, a field of sunflowers that suck heavy metal toxins out of the ground. By electrifying a portion of it, you can see this tall, taller group of sunflowers, we aim to suck out a larger amount of toxins faster. Now we, we realize that we could uh, commercialize this. So right now we're creating a business targeting um, your average urban farmer that's looking to improve uh, micro scale food production, as well as uh, larger scale agriculture. Um, projects with uh, increased yields and lower costs and the like, all using electricity. Um, now to create a, a new product in the ag space is a, is a bit difficult, so we have to get word out, and we do that by educating the market. We do that through content marketing, and initially I've done this by spending the last three or four years writing a book on this subject. It, dis it dispels any of the uh, snake oil claims that may be out there, and really goes into the science behind the scenes. Next, we go about creating community. Uh, we have a, a mailing list, and through social media, we're, we're working with a, a whole bunch of like-minded people around the world who are actually replicating these experiments themselves. Um, and we're I'm teaching people how to do this. We're sharing knowledge. And the whole goal is to spread this knowledge not only to the modern world, but also to the developing world as well. And the way we're doing this is by making things easy for the average person. We're creating a set of turnkey products that will make it easy to run your own experiments at home, not only for, uh, for individual backyard gardens, but also for commercial scale ag as well, um, for uh, greenhouses or small scale farms. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Um, does, does anybody have a question? Um, I, I mean, I, this is pretty, pretty exciting to me, you know. Um, is this Frankenstein? I mean, do, like, do you have to, like, when you put the electrodes in the soil, do you have to say, it is alive? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, who are the questions? Do you have one? Yeah. This is very interesting stuff. Um, so just to make sure I understand, you are putting electrodes in the ground. Correct. And they have a field, like a radius of how far they're going That's to right. get. That's right. And the electricity comes from a generator or from your home, or how does it... Or can you do it off a solar panel? Exactly. You don't need a lot of electricity to do yeah, this. In small. fact, it's better to use the, smaller, the smallest amount of electricity possible. Um, is, you, you just need less exper um, electricity that would power a watch. It's really super low that, to get a big effect. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the people here in the room um, is, is Rory, and I'm going to call on Rory. Um, Rory has a, a, a business that um, 
they're developing drones, you know, so the, yeah, yeah. you know, so, uh, but not for Pakistan and Afghanistan, but for, for, you know, for farms and for local communities. I'm, I'm just curious, you're doing that because there's this really real need for very precise data about fields and things like that. I mean, are you seeing that the need to have data about for producer is to the point that things like this are making, I mean, because he's talking about really micro level control. Is the, is the goal that farmers want to know what's going on square foot by square foot in their, in their fields and be able to affect that? Yeah. Talk a little bit about how all these things are converging. Well, really in the agricultural sector, it's really becoming about data right now. That farmers have had a few production zones and they've tried to manage their 120 acre fields around soil type for example, or topography. But now we're getting to the point where they're going to put a specific hybrid in a field according to, to the type of soil that's there. And then they'll have a nutrient management program that's specifically suited to this hybrid. Um, so if, if this technology is applicable to like large scale agriculture, it would be, excuse me, very interesting. And um, really to run it out, you know, corn farmers today are actually irrigating Cornfield. So you see a thousand acres and there might be 600 miles worth of drip irrigation in there. And there's no real reason why there couldn't be 600 miles of electrical line buried in the ground if this is actually going to raise that, that production margin just slightly. You know, we've seen great things in, in, in increasing production in agriculture. So you think about um, artificial um, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers. You think about modern hybrids, you think about genetically modified crops, then precision agriculture. These are adding large incremental um, percentages to crop yields. We out of those large um, percentages right now, and now we're looking at the really the small percentages, the one percent, the two percent. You think that that really doesn't really make a lot of difference, but those one or two percent increases in yield, whether it's using UAVs or drones or using a techno an exotic technology like this could be multi-billion dollar dividends to American agriculture. Wow. <laughs> so I guess what I was thinking about, and David, I, I want to follow up and say, does anybody know the mechanism by, I mean, is this magic or is it because it excites the bacteria and they fix more, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, before, I just want to touch on that. So like you talked about, you know, so, you know, if there's drought or shorten the, you know, the germination period, you know, so um, the Midwest, you know, some parts of the upper Midwest right now are in drought and people right. are losing crops. So is this the kind of thing that if you were monitoring your fields and know when you hit a critical point that it makes sense to get out the electrodes because we actually want to accelerate getting this stuff out of the ground before we lose the crop to, to, to drought? Is that the kind of thing that we're talking about that's becoming possible? Well, I, I don't really see it in, in, in this case. I think that here yeah, this is just an, another, an additional aid to actually increase in yield if it works. Right. Um, so, you know, if it can be applied to that large scale, that thousand acre farm, um, then I think there's benefit. I think a lot of people forget the, the actual size of American agriculture. We, you know, it's the last great American industry. Uh, interesting. Could you address, you know, yeah, how yeah. does it actually work? Sure. Yeah, so it, uh, without getting too technical, it works on, on so many different levels. And I did have a slide previously, but I didn't want to break up the, uh, the pictures you know, the nice picture look of things. But uh, what it basically does is it all starts when, when the electric fields touch the plant, it causes all sorts of changes to the, to the physical chemistry, the chemistry at the root level. And what that ultimately does, there's some, some cells within, this, within the plant that are very sensitive to changes in the electric field. And what that does is causes these chain reactions, kind of like nerve impulses that happen in your brain. There are a certain types of... Um, signals, they call like action potentials or names like that, that cause these signals to spread all throughout the plant like wildfire once these electric fields come, up, come upon it. And that causes a whole bunch of chain, chain reactions that flow throughout the plant affecting photosynthesis, respiration, um, metabolism, reproductive rate of cells and bacteria. Um, it, it causes, it could cause um, changes to the genetics, gene expression. So there might be hidden, hidden qualities of um, re resilience against certain types of bugs in there. Um, and it could activate that and call the, cause those to turn into proteins so they could be expressed and activated. 
There's a whole deep science behind it. Interesting. Is that covered in your book? Yes. Yeah, so what, what I'm, yeah, so what I'm getting from what you're saying right now, David, is that the plant is going to be a better feeder. It's going to be, a, you know, grow better and be stronger. It's not necessarily, it still has to have water. So Absolutely. we still need to deal with all, mitigate all those issues around drought, which, you know, can That's be right. like through more mulching or other water retention or even how we put our crops on, on fields. Do we mm -hmm. plow them and put them on contour so they can actually catch more water or do we, you know, whatever. Right, right. Um, so that's what it sounds like to me that you're making, that the electricity, if you're, if you're telling me right, is actually developing the soil food web and the, and the plant that's to right. a greater degree, which is what I think is really important in perennial agriculture too. Yeah. I think there are, are many possibilities of actually mixing the science of electro horticulture with that of permaculture. There's some uh, interesting effects that um, I find fascinating. There's this I idea, they use it in uh, genetics research called uh, electrophoresis, where you can, actually pull, you can actually pull nutrients or pull bacteria electrically from one side to the other. So um, one of the ideas I thought of is, you know, if in, you could have like these, these uh, guilds of maybe nitrogen producing plants and you could electrically pull them to a different portion of your field underground. And I think there's a lot of cool stuff we could start experimenting with. Well, the, I mean, you're just starting to touch on, I mean, I kept thinking when you, listening to you talk is about your, is how you're gonna deliver that electricity, right? Or, or make it happen. So, I mean, you said the wires along the irrigation lines. My thought was, well, charge the water. You know, if, there are, if the water's already good, could you charge the water to a certain polarity? That's, that's one thing you could do. Or, yeah. like you said, different plants that create a possibly a magnetic field or have a charge themselves or magnets mm -hmm. or uh, the other thought I was, um, or could you broadcast something onto the field that would already have a charge or, you know, much like you would do a pesticide, you know, almost like a nanotechnology of of you broadcast something that already has a charge that then dissipates after a while. Right, um, actually, so from my understanding, there are some modern ways of applying, applying fertilizers or different uh, plant additives using charged, charged fields that will just repel the, the substance onto the plant. But I think you could also, if you look back in the records, back maybe 100 to 200 years ago, people were, there are drawings of people watering their plants with some electricity source that went into the water and the water, charged water, went onto the plants and made them grow better. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of neat that that was already thought of and, and actually used, but not used today. I mean, if we're walking around with copper bracelets on, why not put them on the plants? Um, and, and Teresa might actually be better to ask this, but, you know, one of the things that in, you know, as, as a person involved with soil and water conservation is soil health. And so when you're talking, and, and you've said that it's very, very low volts, but of course, you know, I think it's a third of the world's biodiversity is within a soil ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're trying to do is to, you know, minimize inputs into agriculture um, in order to try to reestablish soil health. So can you address that? Um, yeah. So. Let's see. I think by, by mimicking these natural processes, by mimic, see, this is, all, this is all natural technology. People have observed how lightning storms made plants grow a lot faster. So we could conserve on placing inputs in the ground by, you know, rather than adding lots and lots of nitrogen fertilizer, why not make the whole process of sucking, of converting atmospheric nitrogen much more efficient. And so by making the bacteria in the ground convert things at a much higher rate of efficiency, and also by making the plants breathe faster, as the, as the soil dries out, it's gonna suck more air into the root layer, convert it faster, and then, and then provide it, assimilate it into the plant at a much faster rate. So that's, what, that was, that's perhaps one way that electricity would be used for minimizing inputs and all you're doing is capitalizing, capitalizing on uh, 
something's and, already there. And has anybody done, I mean, picking up on what you're, you know, has anybody done any like longitudinal studies to say, hey, here's what happens to the nematodes, here's what happens to all of these things in the soil as we, as we do this approach, or is that something that has to be explored? Because obviously we don't want to just get into it and find out that we're doing something that's... Sure, right. You know, it's like, oh, turns out, let's go back to the phosphates because they weren't nearly as bad as, you know. Right, right. Uh, there's actually a whole, there's a huge body of research out there. Um, a lot of it's covered in my book, but basically um, from, from, the, from the effect of electricity upon bacteria, that's covered in a whole bunch of scientific uh, literature to the effect of um, even the, the electrodes and how those affect the soil. And that's something that has to be uh, uh, addressed because if people start using the wrong type of materials for their electrodes, that could be harmful to the soil food web. So you have to be cognizant and aware of the, uh, some of the, the metals and the chemistry you use. And there are other ways of going around it too, using high voltage fields. I, for, I personally don't address that because it's, um, it could be dangerous to the general public if you're not trained in how to use it. But that's a, a potential solution as well. Good. Um, as we wrap up, because I know some people have time issues and um, you know, online, thank you very much for watching us. Um, but uh, maybe if you could give us a link to on your blog or somewhere where you could point to some of the research that's been done about what this does for the, for the soil health. Sure. Um, I think that would be great. We can send that out to everybody. But you know, I, I think this is a great point to talk about. We've kind of danced around this, but we actually have a system of feeding ourselves that is not, you know, we think it's like, oh, it's very scientific. We've made all these intentional decisions. And reality is that our modern scaled up industrial agriculture is resulting, has resulted from a few things. And, and the first thing is that in the Midwest, um, uh, particularly the upper Midwest, there were forests that were easy to cut down that were near places where you could build a grain mill. And there were a lot of grain farmers from, from Northern Europe and, uh, and from the Ukraine and places like that that wanted to come here and grow grain. And so we had this huge grain basket that developed in the upper Midwest around the rivers where it was easy to transport. So, you know, we weren't always a cereal-based culture, but that kind of worked out for some immigration patterns. Then if you look at the 20th century, um, we had a couple world wars, but between those two world wars, they figured out how to make synthetic um, nitrates that were used in, in gunpowder. And you had a lot of gunpowder plants that were used. And the only reason we could fight those world wars was because they figured out how to turn, how to fix nitrogen in the form of gunpowder. Well, when those wars ended, those, those plants were like, what are we gonna do now? Well, it turns out we can make fertilizer. At the same time, you had the TVA and all these entities that were electrifying rural areas. But they looked at the problem of electrification as getting a light bulb and a radio and, um, and a telephone to every house. If you had instead said, hey, the TVA, we want you to actually get power to every place and, and, and enough power for the electrodes in the field because we don't know how to fix nitrogen any other way, we would have had a completely different model and this would have been the status quo instead of the chemical fertilizer business. But it purely is an accident of wars ending and that's wonderful that wars end and everything. What do we do with this research? Hey, it turns out that we can turn gunpowder plants into fertilizer plants. That's great. What else can we do? We don't have the power there, so I guess we're gonna, that's, that's now our hammer that we're gonna use to improve yields. And, um, you know, so I think it's important in wrapping up that we ended up where we are through some intentional and unintentional things. And we've seen three different takes on how we could do something different with that. And that this doesn't have to be reinventing the world and, you know, let's, let's kill everybody and let's let a couple of people, you know, a couple of wonky people tell everybody else how they ought to live. This is some real valid ways to, uh, Look at this as a, as a moment that there is opportunity. Somebody's going to solve these problems and succeed. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our speakers.